voudrais vous souhaiter le bienvenu à ce débat. Et moi, j'ai le rôle qui m'a été... Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you here to this uh, discussion. Um, I've been asked to um, keep things going. I will be talking... We will be talking about style, about uh, style and substance, content and form. Uh, the way it happens is that I'll give uh, the floor to Hubert Haddad. He will tell us a few words and then read us his paper. And then I will react, see what happens, uh, raise a few questions. And then I know that in the audience there's a collection of writers. They're sort of hiding away. And uh, the only thing I will expect of them is for them to stand up and give their names so uh, that they can be recorded properly. So do touch up your makeup if you need to. This uh, conference... No. no. This conference... This uh, uh, talk is part of uh, a uh, set of conferences on uh, writers and the point of writers. And I'll be talking about uh, this. We've uh, met in Brazzaville also. So over to you and tell us what you need to. Now, the text I'll be reading is something I sort of uh, gave a reading of in Brazzaville. And um, I was asked to revisit this text to trigger the discussion. And uh, we're going to look at the objective subjectivity and see how we can go about it. Now, as a preliminary introduction, I'd like to ask you to remember that these questions were, in fact, raised half a century ago in a very different environment, in a very formalistic approach uh, with the Nouveau Roman. And in those days, things were very different. Today, we're in an entirely different world. So, I added a few lines to my talk, uh, remembering that a uh, university took over the literary environment in the 1960s. Maurice Blanchot was the oracle of the university and considered that language was the state of the common uh, talk. He felt that style was outdated. The dark share related to blood and instinct. The writer, according to him, never chose their language or their style. Style is not part of literature, he said. Literature would be related and started with writing. And in so doing, he excluded metaphors and the imaginary. Writing without writing, bringing literature to this point of absence where it disappears, silence being the sanctification of literature. This is uh, the, French, the basis for the French theory, this terrorism of insignificance, all faced and centered on the science of language, uh, supported by censorship and the post-World War II environment. Style was the uh, enemy, public enemy number one. So, uh, I think that's enough for this preliminary introduction. We could go further and try and look at what they said immediately after World War II. And we could look at who, were organi who was organizing this. Why? Why haven't they ever said who they were and how wrong they were? Uh, and I'm talking not only about Heidegger and Blanchot, but also many others. The representation of a country, a people, a continent, or the world on the move in the media rests a priori on nothing human. The factual description of any phenomenon tells you nothing intimate or nothing key about it, apart maybe from a tremendous amount of documentary of it, evidence, which is soon locked back up into the archives. Only literature gives reality its full dimension, at the same time elusive, lethal, unpredictable, marvelous, 
and wildly open to interpretation. Just as the description of a language does not tell us anything about the breadth of its uses through history, mores, or its mythical and legendary foundations, any purely formal rendition fails the basic test of transmission because of a tautological, incomplete or cryptic form of communication. Literature, along with the arts, literature, along with the arts, is just reality, becoming aware of itself in its enigmatic, symbolic and secular activity. The origin of the world is to be found in the mind of a poet admiring Corbe's painting or the depths of the Milky Way. There is no other place of places than speech in the process of designation. Ancient Greece is still alive in Homer. Without Shakespeare, who only knew his own tongue, so many languages would be deprived of a metaphorical break as a source of transversality and illumination today. While science establishes itself in a necessary object-based face-to-face loaded with so many presuppositions, literature emerges in all haste and speaks of the vanity of power and of the sleepy utopia of the most biting freedoms. Through questioning, dreamlike deconstruction, inexpiable passion, humor, or challenges, literature teaches us that there is never any absolute power, that hierarchies are acts of violence, that the organs of intimidation that institutions of knowledge are should never be accepted without a quarrel, and that writers or artists at work know one single obvious thing the absolute closeness of humans with their fragility, their struggles, their lack of knowledge at the heart of their lives. Given that we all share a condition marked by the scars of language, the most glaring differences are mere nuances, the exquisite rustling of nuances, provided they are both on the lookout in symbolic spaces, there is no more than an angel's breadth between an illiterate child and a brilliant scholar in the minute, unidentifiable thing we call culture. Novels explore the infinite field of nuance, this human truth every one of us experiences directly and differently without realizing how fragile and a transient it is, as does poetry, which reveals its surprising nature through language. Therefore, there can be no decent writer without style, whatever its breadth, as majestic as the nebulae or as tight as metaphorical constriction. In the best instances, clinical writing can avoid repetition through prosody and rhythm. Writers distort language and put it through the kaleidoscope, forever and unexpectedly changing combinations and associations, offering hope and structuring in spirit the unfathomable wanderings of phenomena. Just as composition commands eurythmic representation in Piero della Francesca or Cezanne's works, novels as objects include a living structure, a driving energy derived from writing itself. As Sartre said, Writers are made not by what they choose to say, but by how they choose to say it. Every sentence holds the entirety of language and refers back to the universe. Therefore, an acute strategy of soul summons for an instant or for centuries of delight all knowledge acquired both out of legitimate concern for their durability and thanks to the floating investigation into the unknown lands of sensitivity. Flaubert dreamt of writing a book about nothing, a book which would hold through the internal strength of its style. As he marvelously put it, 
in and of itself style is an absolute way of seeing things. Nothing is more foreign to classical French, kept in high courtier's tight grip to support national conquests, than the fates of language. Style is not just the wordsmith's showcase or the rules of clear speech. It is a native and structuring impulse, the quiet interaction of feeling, intuition and concept, the switch from lexicon to the dizzying heights of syntax, a unique way of moving within a language for an unprecedented interception and capture of meaning. Content is therefore nothing but what the particular intensity of language's impulses and trajectories in a given body, mind and memory yearns, yearns for at a given moment in a given life context and aiming for something that is immediately part of writing, of its haste or hesitation, of its destructive tetany or the lightning bolts of multi masseted speeches, leaping from height to height as Empedocles' speech. For Proust, style is an issue of vision, not of technique. It is, he said, the revelation of the qualitative difference in the way the world reveals itself to us. As we can imagine, the distant prospect of the finished work pervades the worrisome act of writing in the present. It is a creative dialective, a, a Weltanschauung, a constant toing and froing between form and content, between appearance and substance, or rather between obverse and reverse. Indeed, the writer, the writer presents the reader with a strange mirror, wherein, compared to the slow pace and backtrackings of the workshop, everything occurs wholly and hurriedly, the inevitability of events being triggered by the spinning or fanning of pages until the synaptic lights go out. The writing that is more or less irresistible, as a painting or an architecture of words, as an abstract construct of concepts, or as a, successive, as a succession of platitudes, is acknowledged as style as soon as a qualitative and therefore emotional change occurs in the reader's flow of consciousness. Something new seeps into the reading. Repetition gives way to rhythm. Focused images blaze onto the white screen of the page and language shines through poetics in action. You could almost say style is the other. It is the reconstruction by the reader of the necessarily intertwined values of expressions and beliefs at play in the text. Given that Whatever the language, very few tales, short stories or novels are not surreptitiously poetic. Granted, literature does not cover the entire scope of the written word. We could easily come to believe it is but an exception in the ideological and functional space of discourse. Yet when it appears, unexpectedly, or after lengthy maturation, amid the din of misunderstandings, amid general distraction, or amid the silence of censorship, you can be so sure that style is at play, a project carried by a wild desire for, for fulfillment towards some known or unknown but always dangerous prospect. Indeed, style is the sign of a sovereign march across the minefields of our representations and the unstable real realm of the unconscious, the netherworld of the psyche against whose backdrop an inventive reality emerges, gesticulates or disappears, according to a thousand fictions. But what more is style but the resistance of language 
to the phatic attraction of words and grammar. We must first challenge the ineptitudes and approximations found in quotations compendia. Style is an instrument, not an end in itself, said Norman Mailer. Only a literary orderly could say that. If style is an instrument, then Proust and Rimbaud are merely operating theatres. No, style is no more an instrument than art in and of itself would be an instrument of propaganda and education. On the contrary, it distorts all instrumentations and is life itself, replicated ad infinitum in the mysteries of a language. Cocteau pleasantly said, style is not a dance, it is a gate probably referring to the catwalk or to the rolling shoulders of the angel Ertebis. Yet the author of La Difficulté d'être knows that style is the constant tension of, a, of the mind, the dance of a mil million theseuses before the labyrinth of work. He, in fact, will readily admit to it in Le Grand Écart. It can happen that a rosa offers so many different views on the way out and on the way back that hikers on the way back will feel lost. That is how the written word, how the written road feels to lost readers. In a letter to Lucilius, Seneca claims that style is the clothing of thought. Thought dressed up is no more than rhetoric, but style is movement, gesture, thought itself. Standal, the least somatic of writers, stated ad absurdum that the best style is that which goes unnoticed, and the ludicrous idea of covering the civil code with a coat of transparent varnish. But would anyone claim that the best music or the best poetry is the one that goes unnoticed? Without style, without a specificity assumed to its rightful climax, without the constraint of being awake, which underpins the moment on the obsequious angel's wings, there would only be Father de Lille on the one hand and the town clock on the other. Going unnoticed is the epitome of Stendhalian style. It is its inimitable dramatic strategy. In a vaguely Balian way, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote in his situations that obviously style determines the value of prose, but it mustn't get noticed. And as words are transparent, he, long, he adds along the same lines, and as sight goes through them, it would be preposterous to slip frosted glass in, in amongst them. So more DIY here. He writes that with prose, aesthetic pleasure can only be unadulterated if it comes on top. On top? It sounds like a little extra thrown into the bargain at the cattle market. Therefore, language is beneath literature. Style is almost beyond it. Images, delivery, lexicon are born from the writer's body and past and become progressively the reflexes of his art. We recognize here Roland Barthes' handsome rhythm, but we cannot follow him. Is the exclusive call to becoming other expressed by R Rambo, Marina Tsvetaeva or Antona Arto? Are they therefore merely abandonment to some intimate formalism prior to the deliberate consummation of the well of the mind? The author of Writing Degree Zero echoes the thought. Under the name of style, a self sufficient language emerges that delves only into the private and secret mythology of the author, into the hypophysics of speech where the first association of words and things form where the major verbal themes of a lifetime are established once and for all. With Bart and a host of arbiters of letters, the appearance of archaeosemiotic thought on the battlegrounds of arts meant, strangely, that as the symbolic dimension was rightly being freed from reproductive fatality, from innatism and outdated essentialist ideas, 
the university was managing to put literature, the object of its studies, under close supervision through the use of determinist shortcuts, almost derived from the slumber of sociobiology. For instance, style and I quote, is always somewhat crude. It is a shape without meaning, the product of an urge, not of an intent. It refers to biology or to the past, not to history. It is not the product of choice or reflection about literature. It is the decorative voice of an unknown and secret flesh. Style is truly of a germinal nature. It is the transmutation of a mood. So, at degree zero, you have a light-hearted reconciliation with a kind of literary physiologism which Paul Valéry practiced, following in Taine and Balzac's footsteps. He was happy to see the dealings and productions of the so-called mind as the dealings and productions of an organic system. But can we ever understand what freedom the void produces in the harmonic cracks of language? We suspected writing contained the being and the appearances of power in doctrinal spaces as a privilege, as a function of time, reign, social status, barbaric elitism or deep sleep. Yet style is elsewhere and all remains to be invented in reality. A child brighter than lightning warned us a long time ago. The language will be a soul for the soul, thought holding on to thought and pulling. It was Rimbaud. Now, not much further, Léon Paul Fargue, the master of delectable internal claudication, says a perfect sentence sits atop the greatest vital experience. And for Victor Hugo, our perpetual contemporary, truly great writers are those whose thought occupies every recess of their style. Let us close then with the evanescent Emily Dickinson, the magic scribbler. For she alone, beyond language, beyond all authoritative pronouncements, uttered the only truth. What? really is style. A something in a summer's day, a slow her flambeaux burn away. Voilà. Uh, matière à réflexion. Well, that will get us thinking. I'll try and put flesh onto some of this, and I'll also try and keep myself in check. Can I maybe um, throw a few ideas to get you started there? I would say that there is definitely style in this text, and it, was never been, it would never have been written in Swedish, my uh, mother tongue. Um, I'm not judging anything here, but I'm I, I just know that in France and in Italy, I've seen a very clear break between the south and the north. There's a very real difference. In Italy, sometimes I say, tongue-in-cheek, I always say, look, what you say is all very handsome, but you know, you're know, you not saying anything. We have lots of things to say, but we don't know how to do it. So clearly there's an issue of rhetoric here between north and south. Now, we could come back to that later, but I feel that you're talking, talking maybe about uh, turning proper literature, decent literature, into a bit of a myth. Now, we can disagree about what it means or what it is, but um, we too often forget that all literature is not necessarily good. There is some style-less literature. When people say it's only literature, that obviously is pejorative. When you say, oh, this is literature, that's positive. And speaking about literature is always difficult because you always have it loaded on what, on more biased because of good or bad literature. I think people on the whole agree on what bad literature is, but nobody really knows what good or decent literature is. 
For instance, the Swedish Academy um, uh, they award the Nobel Peace, um, uh, lit Prize for Literature. And people always wonder why they award it here or there. And the Academy always says that the only criterion is literature. I mean, do they really know what makes literature literature? I don't know. But they, in fact, are referring to style, to the way it's written, to form. But the relationship between uh, form and substance is always very different and difficult. In every word, there is meaning. I think Morgan Stern spoke about the poetics of nonsense. Um, you would have perfect form, perfect style, but no meaning. So, in fact, I think you shouldn't oppose style and substance, but in fact, meaning and, and style. Now there was something else I mentioned. I, I thought of when I listened to what you sa you said. Uh, of course, we all remember that these uh, dialogues are, are being very international. And the issue I wanted to mention is translations. We all know that literary translations age, contrary to the original text. If you're just talking about the style or the way it's written, or the, the beauty of a text, obviously, um, if that's the key to literature, it's not going to be easy to cross borders. Now, we've only just retranslated Madame Bovary back into Swedish, and it's the third translation in a hundred years. And yes, it's fine. I mean, Madame Bovary is also a masterpiece in Swedish. Now, the handful of people who can read both in French and Swedish, um, in fact, you realize that part of what is tremendous with Flaubert is that, in fact, style disappears or style doesn't play a, such an obvious role. Now, I'm not saying that Madame Bovary's text in Swedish isn't good. No, on the contrary, it's still a good text in Swedish. Now, we're all foreigners here. And so I'm, what I'm saying is that we should maybe look at this issue of foreignness and translation. Now, there's something you didn't mention uh, properly uh, that puzzled me a bit. You didn't really speak about imagination. I, I sort of sensed it, but I can hear it. And the other one would be the word or the notion of truth. Now, look at the history of literature, and this probably stands across the board in every country. There are two criteria about literature, uh, two things that can make this or that writer or this or that text uh, join the history of literature, and that's beauty, form, the style on the one hand, and on the other, fiction or imagination or truth or truthfulness. It's often said that the first literary uh, opus in French is the life of Saint Alexis. Why? Is it because it's fiction? No, but because there's a real exercise in style, in form. Uh, then obviously you've got Descartes, you have a number of historians like Froissart and others. They join the history of uh, uh, literature because of style. Pascal, he's definitely not a novelist, but he has style. And then uh, over the course of time, in fact, there's a switch towards fiction because of novel, novels being more popular in the 19th century. And fiction sort of supersedes style. And then in the 60s or 70s with the Nouveau Roman, there was, well, style striking back uh, with a vengeance and style having the upper hand. So there's nothing set in stone here. The relationship between 
these two building blocks of literature changes over time. Et que chez nous, on regarde avec une petite un peu. And I would say that today. Uh, we in Sweden consider with uh, some kind of bedazzlement uh, self-fiction. It's writing about oneself with a little bit of style and then calling it literature. Uh, but imagination, fiction disappears and the only thing that seems to matter is writing in and of itself. So it's another topic for discussion, this hard balance to strike and we have to take into account translation, this balance we have to strike between style and writing in fiction. Uh, I think I will try and answer the questions you've raised with Flaubert. Um, an answer of some sort coming out of a book that I've written, The Dream of Philologue. And the last short story talks about a writer who's no longer writing. Uh, people thought it was me, but um, he dies at the end of the story, and as far as I know, I'm alive. So this writer has lost his inspiration, but he's also doing research in literature. And he read somewhere that, you may know that uh, Flaubert was uh, taking notes while he was working on his books, and his notebooks were found. So we have the notebooks attached to each novel except one. The notebook related to Madame Bovary has disappeared. And one day, um, I unfortunately suggested to um, a library uh, assistant, as I said that uh, maybe it's a library assistant who couldn't resist the temptation of stealing it in front of 50 library assistants, so it wasn't very popular. Uh, in this book, um, someone finds this notebook in Paris in a little bookshop and in this notebook there is the recipe for writing a masterpiece and I give it to you freely. It's written by Flaubert, of course, it's nothing to do with me, but I may try and explain. Flaubert had uh, a theory about aesthetics saying that truth and beauty are two sides of the same coin. It's difficult to understand what he meant by that. How can beauty and truth be uh, the two sides of the same medal, same coin? I try to interpret it for Flaubert since we've lost forever the notebook. Beauty and truth are at the heart of creation. Beauty is true and truth is beautiful. A masterpiece is made of beauty and truth in each word, each sentence, each paragraph, each chapter. But what is truth? Truth is that nothing can be other than it is. Truth is that each word comes directly from the previous word that you can withdraw or add nothing without changing the whole meaning. Beauty is when you cannot change anything within your text without endangering the, the building. Few quality art is made up of random signs. It's difficult and simple at the same time. The point is to create a piece of work that is in every detail, at the same time, true and beautiful. If nothing can be other than it is, it's the highest possible degree of reality. Style is everything. I have said that and I've repeated that. And in a way, it's true, but not in the way that is usually understood. Style is content and shape. They're both necessary. The reader has to negotiate his way between listening the melody of the work and forget about the melody to try and understand the meeting. Uh, a book with no obvious style, not enticing the reader into the melody, is not about literature. But a book with only style, if such a thing is possible, is not literature either. Every word is sound and content, uh, equally important. One is no more important than the other. Writing a masterpiece means choosing each and every word for style and content at the same time. Each word chosen just for style or just for content is a mistake. Not just a failure, because it would mean that beauty exists in and of itself. It exists in music, maybe, this is what's being said. But in literature, there's no word that can be 
just beautiful or just true. Every word is necessarily both true and beautiful. Can you write a piece of work where a word would be chosen not for the sound, the beauty, and the content? It's impossible. I've tried, uh, I've worked hard on Madame Bovary for five years. I've looked at each sentence, each word. I've carefully studied uh, every line. And some days I couldn't even select one word, not one word. I've also said and repeated it that there is no truth but I was only talking about the, the truth of content, beliefs, conviction. But every time you tr use words, you make things tangible. Nothing can be said without style. Even mathematics are not just um, a shape. Um, axioms have to be expressed through language. It's the only tool we have available. So the recipe for a masterpiece is the following. You have to choose each and every word carefully. It has to be at the same time true and beautiful. It's very simple, but desperately difficult because the balance, the, the way you need to weigh each word um, is difficult to perceive. So it's simple. It's simple, but not simple. Why? If each word you choose has to be um, beautiful because it's true and true because it's beautiful, a word doesn't exist out of the blue. A word exists within uh, a work. You have a, an organization of words. You have a project. And you're going towards the unknown in a certain way. This is what Flaubert did. But Flaubert was positioning himself in aesthetics. And Flaubert excluded from this relationship between beauty and truth as uh, Plato was talking about the issue of good and bad. He, he had a, an aesthetic relationship between beauty and truth coming from the Parnasse movement. Every artist that came up with provocative work and interesting work suffered from producing it. Madame Bovary is a masterpiece. But in a way, uh, it's uh, an involuntary masterpiece. Dostoevsky wrote masterpieces because he was very involved and people said about his style, it's non-style, he doesn't know how to write, he's been criticized, but he was in such a, he had such a desire and a passion for writing um, he was so involved in his project, talking about the relationship between evil and good, that he totally transformed literature. It, it may be more complex. The issue of style and content is obsolete. It's out of date. I only looked at this. Uh, uh, I've put it in, in a different setting as yours, in a Franco-French setting. Uh, what we've experienced following the Second World War, after the German occupation, where we wanted to exclude humanity because of the episode of collaboration and all uh, writers that became popular after the period of occupation said nothing about what they had done during the war. And this is the meaning of my text. If we wanted the new roman, this is why. If philosophers started saying humankind doesn't exist and started discussing this opinion, it is because we no longer wanted to deal with um, the abandonment of mankind, with uh, treason. Uh, we have to think back about history. Uh, we had the war of independence in Algeria, and then a lot of people started uh, forgetting about their past with uh, May 68 and afterwards. The only thing we can criticize Heidegger for is that he never wanted to come out and think about his non thinking. A philosopher has to think about his in incapacity to think. Maurice Blanchot in 1940, Maurice Blanchot 
started leading um, intelligence work in France. Uh, he was a supporter of Mora, he was a member of the Action Française, and then he, he became the, the supreme master of, of, of writing. But with a strict moral, he was extremely demanding with himself, but he left out completely uh, the question of good and evil, and this is not acceptable. And what is style all about? Style is um, the embodiment of, of humanity. It's not just Céline, it's Benjamin Fondan. All these uh, writers, all these people who are trying to talk about their despair, just like Dostoevsky, uh, using a certain type of style, writing in urgency. Uh, so we wanted to go back to the old rhetorics, the old traditional classic rhetorics, the objective world, the object, fact-based world, uh, with uh, the possible outcome of silence, the silence of the poets. Uh, and the transparency of writing, but th this is all nonsense. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting, I agree with you. Very often what happens is that style um, rules, stylistic rules become very rigid. Uh, I remember writing a literary essay in French and I sent it to the publisher and they started correction. Well, it's my job to speak French. Um, I was quite proud on my French, uh, having spent some 30 or 40 years here. And when I read the corrections, I felt really ashamed of my French. So I apologized and my publisher said, don't worry, you, you, you really uh, in on the par with the average French writer. But then we had an interesting discussion. I wanted people to feel that this book written in French was written by a foreign writer. And she said, this is impossible. This is not allowed. So there's a dictatorship of what good writing is all about. Uh, Koroma said one day that he wanted to have the freedom to twist French t syntax. And because of Molière, because you have a very old literature going back five centuries, six centuries, we in Sweden, we start reading at the end of the 19th century with Strindsberg. We have no literary baggage. We don't care whether we can read Molière or not. You have so much luggage that it's, it, you, you, you become solidified, um, paralyzed, and you feel really good about yourself. It's a way of excluding others. What I mean is that it's cropping up again and again in French culture. It's already happened. Uh, it's happened with the putsch on language. A hijacking on language uh, that took place at the end of the 16th, well, end of the 17th century. Um, all the French languages of the time were forbidden in a way. And courtesans, um, Malherbe Boileau, came and decided on a s single language, the language of power, the language of the law. And if you go back to French literature in the 16th century, it's crazy. Uh, you have uh, play writers, uh, poets, it's uh, the lit literature of the Baroque, uh, and you have the brothers and sisters of Shakespeare, Ben Jonson and others, all these writers. But suddenly, uh, language was imprisoned, uh, language was uh, in a straitjacket. But of course, some people always escape from a straitjacket, Racine, Corneille, and a few others. But without this hijacking on French languages, we would have another, a different French literature. And what we saw after the Second World War was a, a repetition, a reoccurrence. Uh, and as Freud was saying, repetition is death. Right. Maybe we can now give the floor to the audience. So, if you want to take the floor, and I've 
been asked to tell you, you have to stand and you have to say your name and then you can ask your question or you can make your comment. Donc il faut se lever, il faut dire qui vous êtes et puis voilà, il y a le microphone qui arrive là. So please state your name and then ask your question. My name is Burok. I don't really understand what you mean when you talk about literature too much. When you talk about literature in such a lofty way. When I read a nice poem, I don't need an academic to tell me that it's beautiful. When I read a good novel, I don't need a specialist to tell me that it's a masterpiece. For me, literature has to be magic. Literature has to be instinctive. And I think that writing is coming from the guts. It's coming from someone's uh, inside. It can be beautiful, it can be nasty, but it's always meaningful. This is what literature is all about. And the rest is only words. Personnellement, je suis d'accord. Il vaut mieux faire... I agree with you. It's better to write good literature than talk about literature, but there you are. Bonjour. Donc il faut dire que vous vous adressez pas à moi, vous vous adressez au non, public. Non, non, non. je m'adresse à, à tout le monde, voilà. Gaspard Marie Janvier. I don't want to uh, start talking about style based on a rhetoric, uh, which is a fourth rhetoric, to hear that the French language uh, of the 16th, 17th century was put in a straitjacket when it produced Racine, Pascal, Corneille, Madame de Sévigné, the greatest writers, not just in French literature, but they're among the best world writers. There's something wrong, uh, but there's no point in continuing on this uh, dispute. What I want to say, the, 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 the whole point is, what do we mean by style? Very often when we talk about style, we want to talk about talent. But since talent is a very uh, notion that is very difficult to define, we talk about style as if style could be described objectively. Uh, style in a text, whereas literature is clearly an abstract Art, it's different from tangible forms of art, uh, sculpture, painting. Uh, the yellow in painting is exactly the same yellow as what you see on the wall, but literature is all about words, and words are abstract. Uh, so, of course, uh, reading involves the reader, the imagination of the reader, but as long as the word is missing, there's no literature. Without words, there's no literature. So style is everywhere. You can find style in the phone book, uh, in the phone directory. Uh, it has its own style. So when we talk about style, very often what we mean, we mean about talent, we mean about skill. Um, clearly the writers I've uh, quoted just to quote French writers, but I could quote many other writers from elsewhere. Clearly they have a talent, uh, a writing talent and for novel writers uh, they can even sometimes in a novel include several styles a, a novel is about different characters and if all characters have the same style it doesn't work you need to have several styles according to the several characters of, of a novel so we're not necessarily looking at the style of the writer but we admire the talent uh, of the writer to create styles and for each character or for each topic its own style so style is something that you can work on from a technical point of view but when you try and assess uh, a novel on the basis of its style, very often we get it wrong because we start separating content and style and it becomes uh, pointless. Good afternoon, Pinara Sele. Pinara Sele. Since we are within this festival, Etonnant Voyageur, uh, uh, I'm not French, so my French is sometimes not uh, sufficient. But what I want to express is that I may not understand everything about this debate, but I, I want you 
to start a, a journey, to come on a journey with me. Ten years ago in Turkey, I was in the jail. And in that jail, I saw a lot of things that could not be explained. It's true for every form of authority or fascism. You, you can't explain what's happening. Every day someone was being tortured. A lot of women were raped. Uh, they were yelling from dawn till night. And you can try and explain, saying it's all about politics and sciences. I'm a sociologist. You can try and provide an explanation, but explanation is not enough. So we need to write about what cannot be explained. This is what talent is all about. There was a Kurdish woman, very old Kurdish woman, who was singing, singing a song uh, that we, we needed to sing, we needed to write, we needed to write to understand. When you live through very difficult things, you need to express them. And writing, writing songs, writing novels, painting can help you express unexplainable things. So, literature can be about that as well as uh, Flaubert or Turkish writers, Kurdish writers, still alive today. And when I went to school, we had to study the rules of Ottoman poetry. This is something that is... Uh, the style of uh, writers that are only known by university students. Let me just add, uh, there's a difference uh, between what you say and the book of Primo Levi, if this is what man is all about. Can we consider this as literature? Uh, I know that the the first testimony of uh, suffering in the camps in Germany. I, I saw studies of the style of Primo Levi in that book, uh, uh, and I think it's um, nearly uh, it's uh, it's related to your moral sense to read it from that perspective. It's just to comment on what you just said. Jean-Claude Carrière, bonjour. Jean-Claude Carrière, I see that silence is uh, reigning. Please let us continue this wonderful exercise, uh, particularly enjoyed by French people, a discussion on literature. It's something we just love, like cassoulet or omelette with truffles. It's something that is specifically French, and we have to enjoy it to the very last bit. There's no word without meaning. There are at least three words with no meaning, writing, style, and literature. It's impossible to define those three words. And that's why I'm very happy to be present this afternoon. It reminds me of my years uh, at the university as a literature student. But it's so typically French, so Franco-French. Uh, it, it's perhaps part of our lifestyle. It's perhaps part of the way we live our lives. Uh, we are wonderful at discussing literature, and I hope that we can continue for a long time discussing literature in a Franco-French way. Azouz Begag. Azouz Begag. I'd like to talk about another form of style, which I've called the perforating style. I didn't study literature. Uh, I did electronics studies. But I have so many things to say, so many things that I wanted to say that I one day put pen to paper uh, to express myself. I didn't grow up in the Turkish jails, but in a favela, in a slum in Lyon, which is also kind of social prison. prison. And one day a child asked me, is it true that you were born uh, in a can of oil, bidonville, bidonville, and he said, how did you get out of the can? Uh, 
is a pun in French, bidonville, bidon d'huile. For electrotechnicians as myself, by trade, in a human life, you have several layers, layers of sediments with your, within your heart, which represents the different emotions and feelings that you've been through over time. I really believe that this is, at least this is my experience, if you can dig through the different layers and if you can get to the oil, if you can extract a novel from it, a book from it, then it works. Thanks God, I've never wondered about style because otherwise I would never have dared writing. You know, my father and mother, they didn't know how to read, just like all children coming from poor and migrating parents 60 years ago. I would never have dared put pen to paper. I've never read Balzac, Racine, Corneille. I've never seen them. I've never met them. So, luckily, we're not asking ourselves such questions. Luckily, we, uh, children of poor parents, uh, and literate parents, we find ways of digging through the sediments of our heart. And, and, and we just dare. We just dare and we go for it. And finally, we see that even illiterate poor people can express something that is beautiful, that is true, and that is useful. That is useful for the upcoming generations. There are some young people in this room who have come to learn what style is all about so that they can start writing a book with style. So what I tell them is use the, the direct style, the perforating style. This is what you should seek. Yahya Belaskri. Yes. Can I just um, echo what has just been said? This issue of despair and desperation that leads to style is very relevant. I wanted to uh, give a quotation of Kadeb Yassin, an Algerian, a uh, great Algerian. He's 17 in 1947 and writes the following. Hello to you, my life and my despairs. I am back in the rut where my misery was born. And there you have it. He's a poet. He's 17. And he encapsulates the drama the Algerians have gone through in uh, colonization. 1945, the events in Sétif, uh, his mother is arrested and goes mad. And in fact, he wrote this text for his mother, for the Algerian, against uh, this uh, uh, despair. So uh, desper uh, desperation uh, or perforation is right. I mean, in Seoul, at, at Seoul, he was told, look, uh, you've got sheep in Algeria, write about sheep. So he wrote uh, Nejma, which was a great break. Herdin, the Moroccan uh, poet, said, Kateb Yassin, we owe him so much. Not just because he wrote about Najima and four men courting him, but because oh, it was courting her, sorry, uh, he he was giving this circular writing, this circular form of writing that was so, such a break with the past. So style, that's exactly what style is, uh, managing to put words onto facts and telling the truth while managing to use metaphors and abstraction. So for me, style is important. And deprive of style, literature isn't really literature. Well, aren't there non French people in the room? Uh, don't they want to say anything about this? 
this issue. Uh, don't they want to take up uh, my question about the French style of Franco centric writing? I mean, you know what it's like when you go to a bookshop in France. You've got French bookshop on the other, and you have a, a literature in French, so from Morocco or North Africa, or whatever, and then you've got translations elsewhere. And I was always struck by the fact that uh, this literature in French, generally written in French, but might, which might not go along with the regulations of French uh, literature, uh, with these Moroccan or Algerians or Guadeloupians who want to twist and turn the French language and produce something new. Any comments? Well, clearly, no one's terribly enthusiastic at the prospect of debating. Okay, well, let's move on to the audience then. Any comments from the audience? Are you, I don't know, better adjusted or more motivated than the writers themselves? Uh, good afternoon. Bjorn, could you maybe ask writers to be a bit more prescriptive in the way you do it and ask them, tell them to uh, speak? I mean, style is obviously difficult as an issue, but it's a key issue. I mean, uh, as Monsieur Carrier just said, it's difficult uh, to describe and to define. And writers, writers, we know writers are very doubting and doubtful about themselves sometimes, and you, they have, they're very puzzled. So they might as well say it. Has Hubert Haddad disappeared or what? No, le style en soi, le mot style est totalement. The word style is a bit of a problem. It can mean two things, two very different things. First of all, you've got the da defined style, Doric, Corinthian, the classical style. And then you have Buffon who says style is about man himself. So every individual has his own style. So you've got these two entirely contradictory definitions. And are writing whatever we write, books, cinema, theatre, have to manage uh, this opposition. If you only write for your own self, however potent and perforative it is, uh, if you forget your public, you're obviously going to fail. If you only write uh, by um, applying the prescriptions of Malia Ben Waro and by forgetting the Baroque literature of that period, well, there again, you sentence French poetry to 130 years of silence between that period and up until uh, the Romantic period. So uh, for that period, there were thousands and thousands of verses that were write, written, but not a poem as such. No one has any idea, or I don't think anyone could quote an 18th century um, poem. And Buffon is exactly in that period. And yet he manages to say style is about uh, individuals. So I think that's precisely why it's so difficult to define style. Style can either be what will help us describe or prescribe a way of writing or painting, for instance, or it can be a remarkably individual approach to the individual. Good afternoon. I may be a French uh, French uh, writer, Clément Cagliari. I think that this uh, very French approach to the discussion is a bit strange. Is maybe style about elitism, about the elite? Uh, the French tend to think, apparently, that style is inherited, is inherent, is a gift you inherit at birth. I don't know about that. 
Now, I, I'd like people to tell me this, but I don't know if that's true, but I honestly feel that wherever you come from, in whatever language you come to, Stal is completely disconnected the history uh, of uh, the, the language or the literature in the language. I mean, some uh, novel uh, style and the most potent style is often related to people who have something to tell us so and who may be underprivileged. So if to, 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 to have style, you probably need to have to be able to say something. And Céline said uh, that uh, he, you have to speak from within. And uh, I mean, you might uh, disagree, and we probably need to unpick his books. Uh, he had a very uh, miserable life, a very miserable life in one of the backyards. Well, that's exactly what you need. So style is all about having a lot of content and also, also, you need to work on how you're going to say this and it will take hours and hours to get there. So I don't think you'll have a marvelous style that will just be bestowed upon you or inherited. No, you have to work with pen and paper or, or computer and um, have something to say if you really want to have style. I rejoins a bit this idea because the title of today is to make a style avant tout or de now, remember what the title of today was, is uh, style or content. We haven't really spoken about content. Maybe we should. Well, please do. Speaking about content, while you're thinking about a question, I took part initially in uh, assessment sessions to award international prizes in literature. And I read I in the Nouvelle Ops newspaper uh, a few months ago that uh, someone wrote, novel is dead, thinking about the, the content. But for six or seven years I read uh, books and novels from all over the world in their translation and I can assure you that the novel is alive and kicking and you're right people there are people who have things to say and want to say it in a poetic form or writing a novel I'm, I have no doubt that novel is well alive the danger is if you have nothing to say and you replace content by style or stylistic writing, it's really meaningless and this won't get you an award abroad. Yes, of course. But it's the issue of good or bad literature. We cannot decide what is good or what is bad literature. Readers are deciding, I choose to read a certain number of books and not others, and it's my choice. Uh, and centuries uh, go by and some writers are remembered, others are forgotten about. Even if you have nothing to say, it can still be interesting to read sometimes. Uh, I don't know, uh, Flaubert, uh, Bouvard and Pécuchet, there's, uh, at the same time, it doesn't tell us much, but it's wonderful to read. So uh, it's always the same question that is being asked to mankind. Uh, how can you love, understand what being free is all about? How can you, how do you come to the world, how do you die? And these are issues that we cannot solve, and this is what literature um, is all about. And it cannot be solved by content or political discourse. I think we have a mimetic being inside ourselves, uh, sensible to storytelling. And there's a truth that we meet in storytelling and that you cannot, we cannot meet in, in a debate about ideas. And this is what novels are there for. But we need 
uh, to meet with books. Uh, for me, when uh, the metaphor I have is uh, that of a puzzle. The style of the author has to correspond to myself. It has to fit within my individual makeup. And this is very personal. Uh, and this brings me back to my first uh, comment uh, about style. There are some writers I really feel fond of and other writers that I don't particularly relate to. Céline is not my friend. Uh, I admire him to some extent, but he's not my friend. And there are, there are other writers that I really feel close to. Uh, and, and it's really hard to make the distinction between content and style, uh, presence or absence of style. Well, I didn't. I, I want to say that I didn't come up with the topic for this conference. I didn't choose the topic of the conference, but. I, I'm a, a sheer egoist. When I write, I write for myself first and foremost because I like writing. But. Through perforating myself, I discover others, uh, my culture, everything that I've read, everything that I've within me, and everything that I get from others, I use in my creation. I also cheat to some extent. I write in French, but my mother tongue isn't French. My mother tongue is 70% Arabic, 5% uh, Berberic, 5% Wolof, 5% Barbara, 2% of Sonaki. My mother tongue is a mixture. But when I write in French, I don't just write in French. I write in all those languages because I write about what I feel, because I think in my mother tongues, and I write in French. And it works. Everybody thinks I write in French. <laughs> I'm sorry, my French isn't particularly good. I'm Beck McConnor, I'm from the US. I wonder, who are the new writers experimenting as Burroughs or Joyce were uh, in their time? Who are the experimental writers? Uh, I read Eric Chavillard, I really like Eric Chavillard. But I imagine there are others, uh, innovative writers, but who are they? I, I'm, I don't really know very much about the world of uh, publishers, but I, I sit on juries to the, the awards and I always ask myself the same question. Uh, not many writers dare to take a risk or they don't find a publisher. I don't know. There are very few innovative writers and we need innovative writers. One last question. Commentaire. Bonjour, monsieur. Il faut se lever. Ah, j'ai le, j'ai le trac. Non, il faut se. Lever. Please stand up. Even if you're impressed. <laughs> Mr. Bezag, Mr. Minister, it's very strange to be in the same room as you. I'm, I don't come from the world of literature, I'm in the world of sports, and it's uh, because of love, the love of the woman, that I started looking at literature and I understood that I could understand a, a book with a wonderful teacher. She's sitting next to me and she took the time to explain to me what was happening in a book. Um, and for a start, uh, when I went to school, I wasn't allowed to read. Uh, and you, you've forgotten to say that reading uh, was about enjoying yourself. I nearly fell asleep uh, at the beginning of the discussion. And then Azuz Begak took the floor and other people said intelligent things. You know, I, I'm very basic. Uh, I come from the world of sports. Please be simple. It, it doesn't mean anything, uh, what you say. If you want people to start reading, uh, please uh, give people the, 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 the desire to read. Uh, I've got my own teacher. 
um, today I'm able to write. I've written a book. It may never be published. I don't care. I'm proud. I've written a book. And for me, literature was a different world, a world that was closed to me. So I just want to say to these wonderful people, writers, uh, uh, you're wonderful, but we're different from you. We're different. Uh, please go to schools, try and meet with normal people. Uh, maybe go to the slums. Uh, you're wonderful people, but because you use a, a given jargon, because you abide by rules, we cannot connect. Uh, we cannot connect, and I think that true writers are people who have things to say, who have lived through good and bad. I live an incredible love story, um, and if I could, I would put it on paper, or I could turn it into a play or a, a film, but I don't feel that I I'm allowed to write a, a theater play. Uh, an electrician has to say that electricity is uh, fashionable. I'm sure that there are millions of people in France who find it difficult to come to Etonant Voyageur because we don't feel that we belong here. We don't feel that uh, our place is here. And I'm glad I've said it. Yes, in this very room, I think that half of the people in this room are writing, are writers. Uh, uh, the majority of people have really tried to explore uh, their inner self through writing, so it's possible for everybody. And what I fear is that this debate which we tried to have uh, this debate which we have tried to have is so sophisticated, is so far-fetched that it might scare people off. Uh, people who are trying simply to talk about themselves. Uh, what have you tried to do in French? Tantam, tantim? Right, thanks for attending and particularly thanks to those that have taken the floor.